Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion, Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 220. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jujitsu approach, and I'm happy to be joined today by Rachel Ranshaw. How's it going, Rachel? Hi, great. Happy to be here. <laughs> happy to have you. Now, people who follow us on social and subscribe to our premium service are probably already familiar with you because you've been helping us out with some video reviews on there, which I greatly appreciate, and I know the community does as well. But for everyone else who might not know the name yet, why don't you give yourself a quick intro? Tell us all about who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. I'm Rachel Ranshaw. I'm a black belt under Andre Galvao at Autos HQ and PJ Barch at 10th One at South Bay here in San Diego. And I've been training for about 12 years. Nice, nice. You know, I keep hearing about this Andre Galvao guy. I'm starting to think he might be a really good coach or something. <laughs> I feel like he's probably been doing that for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd actually love to get him on the podcast at some point. I've been following him on social and I've, he's done a lot of great posts recently about coaching kids, which is something that we've talked a lot about on the podcast recently. And I'd love to get him on at some point, but yeah, you guys have a great crew down there. We just had Amanda Bruce on the podcast in the last episode. So yeah. there's a lot of awesome coaching knowledge and it's great that we get a chance to tap into it by talking to folks like yourself. So thanks again for coming by. Yeah, for sure. I'm happy to, I'm happy to be on here. So tell me a little bit about yourself, Rachel. I mean, we know that you're a black belt under Andre. We know that you've got some, some really great insights, particularly in gi, no gi, in the grip fight and the transition between them. But why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, what you do, who you are, things that the audience might want to know to break the ice. Okay. So I have a degree in biology. And I think that's like one thing that's really shaped my approach to jujitsu and my approach to learning as a whole has been coming from like a science background where like it's really dedicated to like biology and like thinking about getting a PhD and like being able to learn in that way and then taking those like learning tools, being able to apply that to how I study jujitsu has been something. I've been really focused on. Outside of that, I live in a van. <laughs> I have a dog and a cat and myself in a van, and we just travel around and train. <laughs> we, we've had, you know, it's funny. There's like this massive nomadic presence in the jujitsu community. I mean, of course, Margot Ciccarelli kind of put that on the map. We've also had a lot of other guests who kind of live the nomadic lifestyle. And I, I think there's something about that and just how it kind of goes hand in hand with jujitsu. I mean, there's so much benefit to kind of cross training and going all over the place. So I just, it's interesting to see this emerging as a pattern where so many people are basically structuring their whole lives around getting from point to point and being able to train more conveniently. I love that aspect of your story. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's awesome to be able to have that kind of freedom to be able to like choose how I curate my own training. Well, hey, on that note, something that we talked about doing as a topic for this episode, we'd discussed some good topics that we could go over here on the show. And one of the things that you mentioned, which really got my interest, was note taking. You'd said that this is something that you're really passionate about, that you make as a deliberate part of your training regiment. And I think everyone at Jiu-Jitsu has tried this here or there, but might not have a kind of a formal or structured way of doing it. Maybe talk a little bit about that. So how does note-taking help you get better? And what do you actually do as part of the process when it comes to taking notes for jujitsu? Yeah, for sure. This is one thing that like, if you see me at any given gym, you'll know I'm there because either my dog is there or my giant notebook's on the side of the mat. <laughs> <laughs> so I pretty much always have my notebook with me. It's something I recommend to anybody who ever asks me like how to get better or how to get the most out of your training. And for me, that's always been note-taking because you can always add that in 
without having to take something else away. Like if you added more hard sessions in, you're going to have to sacrifice something else. Whereas note taking is like, for the most part, only a positive, you know, like you can add more to your jujitsu without taxing more and asking more from your body. Right. So is this something that you've always had as part of your practice? I mean, were you taking notes since day one white belt or is this something that you added onto the process later on? Uh, Yeah, I've actually been doing this since I started. So since I was 15, I have like my very first notebook from back then, too. (laughs) It's really, really funny, like looking back and being able to see those like dated notes from like whenever it was like 2012. It's great. Like been doing it forever. I've been doing it consistently the whole time, too. So I've got like stacks, stacks of notebooks. Now, do you ever go back and consult those or do you find that a lot of that stuff is out of date, either because the sport has moved on or maybe your knowledge has improved to the point where those notes aren't really relevant or accurate anymore? I would say that probably my first several like smaller notebooks aren't necessarily relevant, but As I've like grown in the sport, anything I think from about purple belt forward, I have like several big like three inch binders that are full. All of those are like material I would still happily refer back to, even if it is with a bit of a different perspective of like, oh, I don't do this exactly like this anymore. But there's a bunch of things that are in there that I still go back to, even if it's just like a sequence of drills or how somebody in particular taught this order of events of this move. Right, right. Now, what inspired you to start this process? So many people who train jujitsu, they kind of just show up and they're kind of on autopilot on the mats. You know, they listen to the coach, they drill the things that they're supposed to drill, then they go home and they come back and they repeat another day. But a lot of people, even though they know it can be beneficial, don't add note taking to part of the process. Did something happen where you realized that this would be a good supplement and something that you should bring into the practice of jujitsu? I'm just curious to get some feedback on how this came about being such an integral part of your training. Yeah, I think one reason I was so apt to like try note taking, especially so early on at White Belt, like before I even knew it was like going to be a valuable thing was because I did middle school and high school completely on the computer. So pretty much everything school related through middle school and high school was like teach yourself. And you have this set amount of tests to do on the computer and you're responsible for getting things done however quickly or slowly you want to like my whole goal with that when I started that was to graduate early. So anything I could do to like speed that process up and make it more efficient is what I would do. So then like that kind of became my approach for jujitsu too, where if I could take notes and really retain whatever was being taught, because that was super overwhelming in the beginning, because there was just an entirely new stream of information that I had no idea about that I really wanted to be able to remember what I learned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, has your process changed? You know, being a white belt is very different from being a blue, purple, brown, black belt. I can say for certainty that the way I think about jujitsu now is night and day different from the way when I started. I just completely look at the sport through a totally different lens. And I think everyone who's trained for some period of time goes through that experience where they kind of learn to look at the sport differently. Does that reflect in your note taking? Do you find that the way that you take notes has changed from your white belt days up until now? For sure. For sure. I feel like the last probably five or six years has been fairly similar in like my style of note taking because I feel like that's what I finally figured out worked best for me. But in the past at White Belt, it was really more or less just a journal of what we covered in each class. And it was in like a regular like spiral bound notebook, like something where I couldn't reorganize it. Just like, okay, today we did this. Here's some details. This is like why we're doing this and the date. And that was about it. And like anything that I felt like I really needed to remember, I would write down. And that's kind of evolved into like what I do now, which is much more organized and systematic rather than just like a stream of consciousness of a class. 
Got it. Got it. Now, are you a, it sounds like you are anyway, a pen and paper person, or are you a completely digital note taker or some combination of the two? I'm completely pen and paper, which I feel like is probably not the norm, especially considering like I just came back from Europe and I brought my entire binder with me. (laughs) But yeah, completely pen and paper. I feel like that helps me with my learning and my retention. And now that I have it in a binder with tabs, like a crazy person, it's organized enough that I can refer back to things and find things really quickly, like if I had it on like a digital platform. Yeah, yeah. I mean, digital platforms are one of those things that have they have a lot of strengths, but they aren't perfect. There's always considerations if you're going to do things completely digitally. I mean, I, of course, I work in technology. I do this podcast, so I've got a ton of digital notes all over the place. But if you were to ask me, what am I doing to keep track of this conversation that you and I are having right now? I've got a pen and paper notebook in front of me that I'm writing down things that you say, and that's going to be used to create the show notes and everything like that. I mean, part of the reason I do that is because I don't want the listeners to have to hear me annoyingly clacking away at a keyboard while we're supposed to be talking. But (laughs) but I too am a, a fan of pen and paper. There's just something even beyond the process itself, there's something just satisfying and tactile about actually writing on physical paper, right? It's just kind of a an enjoyable experience that you don't really get when you're banging away on a keyboard or tapping on your phone. For sure. And then like, even beyond that, the like satisfaction of seeing a page fill up with information, like that scratches an itch in my brain right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, hey, here's a question I got to ask you. You know, you're on the mats, you're taking notes probably before, during and after training. You're using real physical paper. Do you worry about, you know, your hands getting sweaty and ruining the pages? Or, you know, maybe you viciously choked your opponent and your hands are covered with their blood or something like that. Like, (laughs) are these issues that you have when you're taking notes? Actually, yes. (laughs) So I definitely like, I'm one of those people that I like let my whole arm drag on my paper. And I have to consciously not let my hand do that after training because I get very sweaty and then my paper is just kind of ruined. (laughs) But another thing that'll happen is if I just like throw my binder off into a corner open, sometimes like if somebody's like having a wrestling round and they get carried away, they'll like end up ripping out a bunch of pages in my notes if they step on it or like long step into the spiral bound spirals (laughs) (laughs) spirals <laughs> <laughs> the long step into your notebook that's a new sequence i've never heard before <laughs> so that that's happened and that sucked and that's made me have to like completely rewrite some pages but i've learned to buy the reinforced paper <laughs> well that's a very important point to bring up you know people love to talk about the convenience of taking digital notes but you know what one thing i learned a long time ago is anything that you bring into a combat sports gym is subject to destruction, right? Yeah. And if you're going to bring in a thousand dollar iPad that you're going to use to take notes, you got to understand some white belt is going to get doubled on top of your thing and his giant ass is going to break your iPad. And you know what? Better that they do that to a five dollar notebook than a thousand dollar piece of technology. <laughs> well, for sure. I also feel like it can be a little bit easier to use during training and immediately after, like, a paper platform where you can just pull out a sheet and like write a note real quick. Yeah, yeah, I agree. With note taking, the most important thing in a lot of ways is ease of note taking, right? Having the best digital note taking solution in the world doesn't do you a lot of good if it takes you three minutes to boot the thing up and take a note and then two more minutes to save the file and close it. The beauty of pen and paper is you just pull it out and you throw your idea on there and and it's done. And when it comes to getting notes done, having a system to let you do it fast and quickly is kind of more important than anything else because if taking notes is a pain for you, you're just not going to do it, right? And it's hard to get more convenient than just a tiny notebook with a piece of paper, a pen, there you go. Exactly. And I think another way to like further streamline that is developing like, some essence of your own shorthand so like for me even things as simple as like right and left are just capital r and l and like same side far side like are like ss and like Mm -hmm. fs like things like that to where i can write things faster but i'll always know what i meant if i look back at it five years later yeah yeah that is so key especially if you've got an instructor who's talking 100 miles an hour right you want the ability to make sure you you catch the big idea without getting too distracted. That's actually something I would love your feedback on. 
one of the problems with note taking is that it can divide your attention, right? If you're taking notes and listening at the same time, sometimes I find it's really hard to actually absorb what the person is saying and to think about it deliberately because you're so busy trying to get the ideas onto paper that you're kind of rushing and scrambling to get everything there. So you're kind of going into like transcription mode rather than listening mode. Do you have a solution for that? Do you have that problem or is that just a me thing? Yeah, so that's something when I took notes at Blue and Purple, I would be actively writing the notes as whichever instructor was speaking. And like, it was great, it worked, but I felt like I wasn't fully absorbing the information as much as I was just like a conduit to get it onto the paper. And now like I've stepped away from that and I write my notes after class. Yeah. And something about the fact that I feel responsible for taking my notes afterwards, I can just like push the information into my brain really hard. And I can usually get pretty much every detail like secured in there long enough that after sparring, I can sit down and write all my notes and feel really good that I got the information that I needed and was able to like relay it all down onto paper. And even that process of having to like re-remember things even further helps, I think, with that learning process. Yeah, that's actually, a, we've talked about this on the show before. I think it's a psychological principle called a effortful retrieval. Okay. And the idea is that if you want to really learn something, you have to make your brain work to retrieve the information. And that's part of what strengthens the process and makes it easier for your brain to recall stuff. The problem with the way that a lot of people train jujitsu is I'm talking particularly about the hobbyist level, right? Where people are doing this for fun. They roll into class, they train, they go home, and they don't really reflect on what they learned, right? And if you don't go through that process of reflection and trying to force your brain to recall things, it gets harder for your brain to pull that information back out. But if you practice the active recall, it strengthens that information in your mind and makes it easier to retrieve later. So they call that effortful retrieval. And that's why I actually moved towards the same process that you do, where instead of trying to take notes during the class, where I'm basically just a conduit for the words, I'm not even thinking, I'm just trying to get it on the paper. I wait. And then after class, either a few hours or even the next day, if I'm feeling, you know, really like challenging myself, I'll try to recall that stuff. And the act of doing so makes your brain work, right? And by making your brain work, it's, I mean, it's like strengthening a muscle, right? It's going to make it easier for you to recall that information. So I always suggest to people that if you want to get maximal value out of your notes, it's not just about capturing the info at the time. You want to wait a little bit and then make yourself work to remember the stuff. And then you're going to, you're likely going to have a better time remembering that information going forward. Yeah, for sure. And I think like, at least for myself personally, I end up re-encountering my notes several times through the process of filing them away. And then I still pull back and refer back to things when I'm when I need them again. So like, I'll pull out my piece of paper, write all my notes down after class or that evening. And then I put it in the front of my binder. And I look back at whatever we covered that week, almost every day. And then towards the end of the week or towards whenever the front of my binder gets full, I pull it out, review it one more time, and then I put it like in the specific tab in the subsection that it belongs in. So it's like I'm just continuing to re-encounter this information and push it a little bit deeper into my brain. And then if I ever need it again, I know exactly where to get it. So how... I love, by the way, the idea of categorizing that information so that you can find it later, because something that I encountered when I started taking notes is it works really good for the first month or so, but eventually you get to the point where you've got so many notes that it's hard to actually go back and find stuff because there's just a mountain of paper that you've created. So then organizing the notes and making them easier to find later becomes very important. Otherwise, you're just not going to do it. How frequently do you go back and actually consult the old stuff and and why do you do it? Is there a trigger or something you encounter during training where you decide, you know what, I got to go back and take a look at that cross leaf module I was studying last week. Is there some rule or something you consult to determine when you're going to go back and reflect on that stuff? So I'll pretty much go back and look at any section that I feel in whatever moment for whatever reason I feel like I need to work on like, wow. I just keep getting taken down with this one particular thing. I should look at my wrestling notes or, wow, my guard's kind of shit right now. <laughs> so then I have to pull up my guard notebook and like 
see what particular things I could be doing to counter whatever's happening to me. So like it'll happen situationally where I'll go back and I'll relook at things. But then one thing I do every single week is I build out a piece of paper for the front of my notebook that I call like my two drill this week, which is everything I'm going to take time that week to drill or even just to think about and have in my brain for when I do go to class and I have my goals for sparring and goals for training. And usually they're all pretty related. So like the one from this week will be similar to the one from last week usually, or it'll change based on my like competition goals or my focus. But I almost always go back to my previous notes on like what things I've been learning or what things I've been working on and throw it onto that piece of paper. And so I look at like old notes at least once a week. Interesting, interesting. Do you find that gets too cumbersome? You know, if you've got 12 to 15 years worth of notes, I mean, obviously you can't go back and review every single thing every single week. There's just too much of it. So do you find that it gets to the point where there's just too much to review or do you get picky and choosy about what specifically you're reviewing and you're revisiting? Yeah, so... I actually have these big ass old gi binders that I rarely look at these days. And then I had like my big three or five inch binder that was like my most recent one. And I just a couple months ago split that into gi and no gi. And that's my more recent information. So like right now I have my no gi notebook in front of me and every tab is organized like newest to oldest in the back. So realistically, I'm probably not going to look at the things in the very back unless I have an idea that I'm looking for something. But at some point, I'm sure I could probably file away the like non-relevant notes, I guess. Kind of like prioritize, I guess, right? I mean, if there's a if there's stuff that you feel like either you've mastered or you're not getting any value out of revisiting it anymore because you feel like you've kind of capped out or maybe you don't use it anymore or maybe just your knowledge has evolved, I guess you could kind of decide at some point to move some stuff to the low priority pile and just kind of stop revisiting it so frequently, right? Exactly. And like the things that I look at a lot or the things that I'm really working on, I'll pull out of the tabs and put in the like front pocket of the binder. So then I have like, even if it might be from different sections, the things I'm like actively trying to be like focused on, I can just rifle through those real quick without having to like flip around in the notebook a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Now, what do you get out of consulting with your notes that you don't get out of just consulting with an instructor or an instructional set that you might be studying? I mean, is there, do you find that there's a benefit to going back and consulting with your own notes versus say, just grabbing an instructional and studying someone else saying the same material? I'm just wondering how that aligns. And is there anything that your note taking process provides that you don't get anywhere else? Yeah. So I think one thing I really appreciate about like my note taking process as a whole is kind of being responsible for your own training. And what is in my notebook is like pertaining to like my specific style of jujitsu for the most part. So I always encourage people if they're like struggling with a particular thing rather than going to an instructor first, if they have the tools to problem solve it themselves and like form some sort of idea of what they think they should do before they go and ask somebody it's going to set them up for like a better learning process if they're already trying to like come to their own conclusions, you know? But I take notes on instructionals and stuff too. I feel like for myself at least, like something about the process of writing it and organizing it into a notebook helps with my personal retention. Yeah, I'm similar. I find that if I take the time to write things down, it helps it stick in my mind. And I think, again, it's that whole idea of effortful retrieval and having to make yourself work to learn something. <laughs> you talked earlier about how a lot of the time people are kind of, they'll just go to the instructor and just ask a question. But I agree with you. I think it's good to try things yourself and to take a little bit of ownership yourself of your learning and to see if you can figure it out on your own before you just go and ask for the answer, simply because if you put in the work, you're more likely to retain whatever you learn out of it, right? It's easy to go and ask for an answer and have it handed to you, 
but then it won't necessarily stick because you didn't have to work to retrieve it or think about it. And also, if you haven't tried whatever it is you're doing yourself and you're just looking for someone to hand you the answer, then you don't have that benefit of actually training and putting it into practice, right? And a lot of the time in jujitsu, it's less about what you know and more about whether you can apply it and do it on the ground. And that just comes down to reps and training and practice, right? So I, I think that's an underlooked aspect of training is encouraging students to try to solve problems first on their own before they ramp it up the chain and give it to their instructor to solve. Yeah, exactly. Like I used to tutor kids and like I would encourage kids to go struggle with their math for a while before I would like go over there and like help them. Like I, I wouldn't want to spoon feed a child because then they're I'm taking away their opportunity for them to learn how to learn. Mm-hmm. Like I think that's so important and that's something like for myself with my science background, I think has helped with like my ability to acquire new skills is struggling through that process time and time and time and time again to where now there's like a better way of inputting that information into my brain in a meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned something earlier that was really interesting. You talked about how you don't just take notes about the stuff that you've already done, but you also take notes about things you want to do. So your training goals, your training plan, your competition goals for the future. And that's kind of different from what people often think about when they think about note taking. You know, people are normally thinking about when I take notes, I'm transcribing what has already happened or what I've already studied so that I can consult it again. But what you've mentioned here is that you also do a degree of forward planning where you're looking into the future and you're planning out what your next session is going to look like. Talk to me a little bit about that and what that process looks like and how you do that. Because I think that's probably just as important for your journey as taking notes after the fact, right? What you do beforehand to prep and prepare can be just as impactful, if not more so. Yeah, for sure. I feel like, honestly, my like to drill this week note page is probably the most valuable thing that I do. I do typically about, if I like rounded it out evenly, probably three different styles of like main types of note taking. One is just like the obvious like notes about moves and notes about techniques and notes from classes. The other is my to drill this week. And then the third one is like questions from sparring and things like that. And I feel like each category has huge benefits. For myself, the two drill this week is something that I'm constantly looking at and is an amazing resource to have because a lot of people don't usually have dedicated drilling sessions each day or even each week, but they might have five minutes before training or five minutes after training. But if they don't have something ready to drill and if it's not actually what they need to be drilling, it's not going to be beneficial time spent. So being able to have that like sheet of paper, note on your phone of, oh, I want to work this, 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 and this, then you're kind of like, you have time wasted instead of having a more organized plan. For myself, this paper usually looks like a couple specific overworking categories. So for myself, it's usually like top, bottom, wrestling, and other, if I'm looking at my Nogi notebook. And then specific movesets, specific sequences, whichever, whatever I feel like I need to be working on in this moment. And I'll have those listed and labeled. And usually they're like priority listed. And then when it comes around for my drilling session of the day, I pull it out and then I know exactly what stuff I want to be working on. I love that example because you're kind of acting like a project manager for your own jujitsu, where you're sort of thinking in advance and planning about exactly what you want to study. And I agree with you completely that a mistake many people make is they don't think about the stuff deliberately. And so when they show up to class, they just go on autopilot, basically. And when that happens, they're going to default to their A game or they're going to default to whatever they find the most fun. But the problem is the stuff that is actually going to help you get better is probably stuff that isn't in your A game or stuff that isn't fun because you're probably going to suck at it at first, right? So I find personally that setting those goals with myself and having a a set of goals and 
things I want to specifically focus on before going into training makes it way more likely that I'm going to actually do that stuff rather than just letting my brain go onto autopilot and rolling just with whatever makes sense, right? It's a hard thing that a lot of people don't do, but going into class with training goals, even just very small goals for an individual day, I've personally found that to be a very helpful experience myself as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, even if somebody's not going to go as intensely into this like whole to drill this week goals for themselves i always recommend to anybody who asks like go into training with at least three goals like you're probably going to be on top at some point have a goal from there you're probably going to end up on bottom at some point and then some sort of other whether it's working out of a bad position submissions from side control from the back whatever have a focus for any place you can vaguely end up, but not have it so diverse that you're not actually putting enough marbles into the jars that you want to be working on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd say the other thing too is I personally like to set goals that are still beneficial regardless of the outcome. So I personally find that goals like, you know, tap out John five times are not particularly <laughs> helpful because first of all, they're not targeted to making any aspect of my jujitsu better. They're all about winning. And when you're in the training room, setting a goal that is about winning is not really productive, right? That's a goal for competition, not for the training room. The other thing is with goals like that, that are dependent on other people, those kinds of goals are hard to really guarantee that you'll succeed at because things are, they're not always under your control. What if, you know, what if the guy that you thought you were going to train with that you wanted to tap out and that was your goal? What if he gets the flu and he's not a class? Well, there goes your goal, right? So I always prefer to have goals that are more specific about things I want to learn. So, for example, you know, whenever I get the chance today, I'm going to try to take the fight to Butterfly Guard because that's what I want to work. So regardless of what happens, if there's an opportunity to move to Butterfly Guard, I'm going to prioritize that above all else. I always find that that type of goal personally, for me anyway, is more helpful. I don't know about for you, but I'd love to get your opinion on that. Oh, exactly. That's just pretty much what I do as well. So for myself, recently on the bottom, I've been work trying to work a lot of arm drags. So if I'm on bottom, usually my goal for like this week might be try to arm drag people from butterfly half, from Z guard, from single leg X. Let's see where I can like get this to work. And then that kind of funnels me into like an area of focus within a round rather than just being like, oh, I guess I'm just going to body lock pass today because that's mm -hmm. not going to give me as much of a return because I'm not looking intellectually at that position necessarily. And then if I'm able to focus my training into like a couple specific positions or moves or move sets, I'm able to like really flush out and find like the strengths and weaknesses and the things that I'm like succeeding and failing at within that move, which is kind of where it comes into like another subset of my note taking, which is questions. Yeah. And I can kind of build off of what happened in the round and take notes on that. So I love that part too, because you're talking about using your notes to create a full reflective process. You're not just using them to write down. And this is the mistake that I think so many people make when they take notes. All they're doing is writing down the details that professor told them, right? Or they're writing down the key details from the instructional they watched. That's good. That's kind of how you would make flashcards that you could study in the future. And there's a place for that. But a lot of the real value is in forward planning and in reflection. And so, you know, we can call this the feedback loop, right? This idea that before you go into class, you kind of prepare and you plan and you set goals for that session. Then you go and you execute. And then after you come back, you reflect and you record what happened and you use that to inform your plan for the next training session. And it is just this feedback loop that goes on, on and on and on. And so when you hear people talk about things like you should train with intention, right? You'll hear people in jujitsu say this all the time, train with intention. And that's kind of a wishy-washy thing that's hard to pin down. To me, this is a great specific way to train with intention is to kind of have that reflective feedback process where you set goals before class, you then go and train, and then you reflect afterwards. And note-taking is a cool way to do that because, again, if you ever feel like you're stuck on a treadmill or a plateau, 
come back five years from now, read those notes, and you're probably going to be shocked at how far you've come along, right? The problems that you faced even a year ago, at the time, they might have seemed overwhelming and insurmountable. But if you've got a, a record that you can consult, you'll come back and realize, man, I'm actually getting a lot better, a lot faster than I thought I was. Yeah, exactly. And I think like being able to take that sort of educated approach to your training and being responsible for your own improvement is like such a shortcut to being able to improve and also get the most enjoyment out of your training because everybody enjoys feeling like they're getting better. But <laughs> learning a way to be able to do that for yourself and not be relying upon any particular instructor or teacher and being able to kind of be self-sufficient in that way has been super valuable for myself and like my own journey through jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. I can imagine. I mean, for me, I found that that process really helped me take ownership of things because when you're taking notes about what's coming up, what you've studied, you start to think more deliberately about things and it kind of takes the ball out of your instructor's hands where now, you know, they used to be responsible for organizing and feeding you piecemeal information, but now you've taken that into your court and the instructor's instruction is just one of those things that you you take into your process. This is something we've had a lot of people talk about on the podcast recently about how important it is for students to own their own jujitsu journey. And I think that when people say things like this, you know, it's very hard to pin down what they mean, but your process seems like a really good way to achieve that. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think like whether like for myself, like training and competing at a high level, I rarely do I feel like an instructor, a teacher, or a class that I'm like attending is necessarily giving me what I need, like spoon feeding me exactly the precise thing I need at this moment. But even at a lower level, like if you're constantly getting put in closed guard and you're only being taught like deep half or double under, you might not be getting exactly what you need in the classes you're attending. So if you're able to like be intentional with the information you're trying to like acquire and being able to apply that in your training like it's only going to benefit you really really quickly and like you'll be able to see those improvements right away yeah yeah so what do your notes actually look like what do you write down i've gone through a lot of different evolutions of this myself i used to try to write down every conceivable detail that came to my mind and i would wind up with these pages and pages of notes for even a single class but I've, I've since evolved my thinking on that. And now I'm much more selective about what I write down in my notes. What do your notes look like? What kind of information do you focus on putting on there? And, you know, at the end of the day, when you go and you write all of the stuff out, what does it look like on the sheet? So pretty much I write, I write things page per page of specifics. So like if the class happens to cover a couple wrestling moves and then a couple like guard passing things, they're probably going to be on two separate sheets of paper, given that maybe those are things that I hadn't already written down. And if they are, I'd probably add it to an older page if it was like, oh, an extra detail or an extra follow up from whatever. But for the most part, I put a lot of detail written as simply and as shortly as possible, because like for myself, I feel like jujitsu is about the order of operations and the like detail and emphasis on like grips and like positioning so if i like avoid that for simplicity i'm really missing the point so i'll have like specific like this moves about two on one and or this page is about two on one like wrestling russian tie and then a couple different finishes and i'll like run through with bullet points key like step by step sort of situations but really really i focus on like if you read this note and you have some idea of like what a russian two-on-one is you should be able to perform this move pretty like pretty on the dot you know like mm -hmm. you'll be able to complete this move properly if you read this note right right is your intent with your notes ever to create an artifact for someone else to study or is it just for you like, is there ever a situation where you take your notes and you give them to Amanda and you say, here, study this? <laughs> or or are you <laughs> expecting that these things are abbreviated to only be useful for yourself? I've had a couple people, like, tell me I should, like, publish this as some sort of, like, jujitsu encyclopedia. 
<laughs> but for the most part, it's always been my intention to have it for myself, for my own training. But also it's something like, especially in the last couple of years, I make sure to keep things really detailed because when I do teach classes or in the future, when I open up my own gym, I want to have something that could be built into like a curriculum or a reference for others. But yeah, I'm definitely open to at some point, like having it be like an open note test. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, that's something that is, is very different about notes versus the way that most people teach jujitsu. Jujitsu instruction normally has this heavily visual element to it where the coach will move their hands or their feet a certain way and they'll basically say, do what I did. And it's the same thing with instructionals. There's a very visual element on the coach shows what to do and then they tell people to copy it. And I think that sometimes coaches rely too heavily on the visual element. I see this a lot on this podcast, actually, where when people come on and we ask them to explain things, they really struggle because the way that they normally teach is they show and then they say, do what I did, right? Copy me. But if you want to explain something in words without that benefit of visuals, you have to really understand it at the conceptual level. It's less about showing what to do and more understanding why you would do it and how you would do it. And I wonder with notes, if you have the same experience, do you find that because it's primarily words, that there's things that you can't do through notes? Or have you found ways to make sure that you can always capture all relevant information through words like that without the benefit of actual pictures and visual elements? I think that's actually something that's forced me to like evolve my understanding of jujitsu and honestly my understanding of language as a whole too is being able to communicate something to myself on a piece of paper that is some crazy complex jujitsu judo wrestling motion and being able to explain it in a way that like I understand in the moment as it's written down but I also know years down the road if I look back I can still understand it and I think that's like a skill in writing and knowing yourself and knowing how you read things but also a skill in understanding jujitsu in a way like if you're able to understand the parts of a simple or complicated movement you can really narrow it down and break it down into words rather than it having to be a visual explanation of the thing if you can say like each of the like fundamental motions and movements happening within that move. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I find too, that when you're taking notes because of those limitations, you want to be a bit selective and you want to try to focus on the things that really matter. And maybe this changes as you get more experienced. When I was a white belt or a blue belt and I was taking notes, my strategy was to write down every single detail that I possibly could just to get everything onto the paper. But after a while, that just becomes a bit overwhelming. It's too much work. A lot of those details, especially as you get more experienced, you don't really need to write down because you might already know them or maybe they're already ingrained in your mind. So what I do now when I take notes is I only put down things that are completely new. So if my instructor is showing a triangle and, you know, almost all of it is just stuff that I've seen before, but they've got one really cool detail that I've never seen before, then that's the part that I'll write down. I'll also try to give some identity to the notes as well. So if I learned, you know, I don't know if I learned something from watching Andre Galvao, right? And if I learned a half guard pass from him, I might specifically call it and say, this is, you know, Galvao's half guard pass. And I find that by naming and giving things an identity, it makes it a lot easier to recall it later. That's something that I know a lot of people do. You got to be careful because you don't want to make up too many names. Then you get confused because other people don't use the same language as you. But I find that trying to give a bit of identity to these ideas makes it easier to bring them back up in your mind later. Oh, for sure. I personally like having to write things down on paper. Pretty much everything in my notes has to have a name, even if it's just like a descriptor of what's happening within the move. For me, it really, really helps with my retention and like recall within a match and within a round if it's organized in a way of even just having a title, you know, like mm -hmm. I know where I'm going with this because I wrote down that specific order of operations in so many words already before. Yeah. Now, what's interesting there is it sounds like when you're taking notes, you're not just taking notes based on what you've learned, 
but you've also got a bit of a training journal there where you're describing how your roles went, how your matches went, what the outcome was. So you're almost using this not just as note taking, but kind of like a jujitsu journal, it sounds like. Am I correct there? Yeah, for sure. Especially my like questions and like problems page. So if I'm like, if I just got done with comp class, I'll usually pull out the sheet of paper that says questions on it and I'll start writing specific things within rounds that happened that maybe went really well or went really poorly or that I just didn't know the answer to. And I'll write it down with as much detail as I could. And I include whoever the training partner was because then I can recall that information a bit better. And if I do need to like, ask somebody else if they have the context of who and when and why I'm having this particular problem, they'll probably be a lot more capable of helping me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great example too, of putting a bit of identity behind your journal as well. Uh You know, if you write a note that says something like Wednesday, June 5th, 2023 training session from half guard, it's very hard to remember the context But if you change it to something like, you know, Jennifer pinned me in half guard and smashed me for 10 minutes and it sucked, that's something you're probably going to remember a lot more easily than if you get too clinical in your explanations, right? So again, I think you give a bit of personality to your notes and it makes it easier to recall that information later. Yeah, for sure. So here's something that I definitely want to ask you about. I mean, if you are a jujitsu professional like yourself, of course, you're fully invested in this as a full-time job. You're putting the time in and you have the time to go through this process. But there's a lot of people out there who would benefit from note-taking, but they do this at a much more reduced capacity. You know, maybe they're, they're hobbyists who train two, maybe three times a week, maybe even less. And just due to where jujitsu fits into their life and their available time, They just might not have a lot of extra time to go through and do notes, which I know can be a very cumbersome process. It can take a lot of time. Do you have any thoughts or tips for people who maybe want to get going on this process, but want to kind of have a lightweight approach where, you know, maybe they're not looking to fill up their house with jujitsu note binders, but they just want to have some sort of practice on paper to help them recall and plan things out. Is there like a simplified model that you suggest to people like that? Yeah, this is actually something I've been thinking about recently is like what I would recommend for the most simplified version of this for people. And I think like a watered down version of a two drill this week paper like I have, that's literally just like what I want to be working on and getting better at this week. Not necessarily, oh, I'm going to commit to two hours of drilling a day because I'm a crazy person like Rachel. (laughs) But what my focus is going to be for training for this week or even this month or this two weeks. So you can go into your training sessions a bit more focused and you don't have to be responsible for coming up with new ideas of what to work on before every single class. Because that's like a habit that could fall away very easily. But if it's something you only have to like form new ideas about once a week... And you can just revisit that each time you go to train and refer back to it. I think that's super, super helpful. And then for like note taking about specific classes, I would recommend like do it on your phone if you need to or find a notebook that's small enough to stick in your training bag or to like be able to bring with you like on your commute to work and just be able to like problem solve and like experience the trial and error of what works best for you with like note taking in that form of like technique note taking Mm -hmm. and then the third part for me which is like my reflective notes one thing i've been doing like with my personal life since i like i do try to like (laughs) note take for that but (laughs) really it's just reflection and like you want to be better at something you have to look at what you're doing wrong is i've started doing that reflective note taking on my personal life as a voice note on my notes app on my phone on my drive home for my night training yeah yeah so i think that's something that would be a great tool for people who don't want to take more time out of their day to reflect on their jujitsu is even just like open up the notes app and just start talking at their phone for a bit like being able to reflect back on their training and have it written down on their phone like without having it take extra time out of their day is great. Yeah, yeah. Something that I've found is sometimes I get really good ideas when I'm driving in the car. 
And of course, I don't want to be trying to take notes and <laughs> while I'm driving at the same time. So I've gotten pretty proficient at yelling at Siri and getting her to take notes for me, just like you suggested, right? Getting her to throw things into the notes app just so it's recorded. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I just want to get it down, written down so that I can go and consult it and maybe organize it later. So what I do now is I've got a lot of facilities and tools for really quickly taking notes. And Siri is like my best friend from that, right? Just taking a quick voice to, to text note on my phone. And then at some point later, when I have a little bit more time to focus, I'll pull those up and I'll try to copy them all in a, into a central place and organize them. I mean, this is, I'm talking mostly about my digital notes here for the moment, right? Not my paper notes, but that's the process that I use to try to capture that stuff. I think with note taking, the important thing is that you don't want perfect to be the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you're like me, it's very easy to be a completionist and a perfectionist and to want your notes to be absolutely spotless and to capture everything. But the problem is if you set up so many barriers to your note taking process that you hate doing it and it takes so much time that you just never get around to it, then it's useless, right? You're better off having an imperfect note taking process that you at least follow and get value out of versus a perfect note taking process that takes you two hours a day to do and you hate doing it so you never do it. Exactly. It just it should be fun. It shouldn't be homework that you dread. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happened to me. There's this really cool concept called spaced repetition. I don't know if you've come into this in your journeys, but basically the idea is it's a an algorithm that you can use to improve your recall. It generally comes down to how people use things like flashcards. So the idea is when you have a new idea, you put it on something like a flashcard, and then at the beginning you review the card really frequently, like on a daily basis, for example. And as you review it, the more you get it right, so if you successfully recall what the material was, then you push out the cadence. So if I remember the note, then okay, maybe instead of reviewing it every day now, I'll review it every two days. And then if you continue to review it successfully, you would extend that to, you know, three days, five days, and it just keeps going. And eventually it might get to the point where you're only looking at these notes once per year. On the other hand, if you fail, so let's say I get this note and it says, you know, recall this technique and I can't do it, then you would go back to reviewing that one more frequently. So that way, if something is falling out of your memory, you're using more work to bring it back. If something is working, then you're kind of still reviewing it, but just not on as frequent a basis. That's a really good way I find to stay consistent over the long term, because the problem is without an approach like that, you quickly get overwhelmed in notes and it becomes very hard to review them all. So if you're going back and you're reviewing your notes, I think it, it's good to have a way to make sure that you're reviewing things that actually give you value, right? Rather than just reviewing the same thing over and over again that you already know. Yeah, that's kind of exactly what you asked me earlier about, like, do I review all my notes all the time? No, like I pull out the most pertinent things and I put it in the front of my notebook so I can like quickly flip through the things that are going to add the most value to my training in this moment rather than do I really need to read this one thing about closed guard again like to where I'm just dreading having this like essay of notes to have to read like what's going to be the most beneficial and not be a waste of my time too yeah yeah and I, I love that approach because I think you've maybe touched on a solution to one of the more common problems in jujitsu which is how do I decide what to train People always ask this, you know, what's the thing I should train next? What should I focus on? And the benefit to having this reflective note-taking journaling process is every time you're training, you're plotting out your goals and you're assessing what worked and what didn't. And that makes it really easy to figure out what to work on next, right? If you reflect on your last class and you realize, man, I sucked at playing this particular position. Well, that really helps you carve out and identify what to focus on next to study. And if you've already got notes on that topic, because you took notes on that a year ago, then you've got a head start as to where you can go to study that. So I think that's a cool example of how this process does more than help you just review stuff. It also helps you goal set and plan and assess where you're at along your journey, right? It's kind of like we talked about earlier. It's like setting up a roadmap and a plan for your own jujitsu journey. Exactly. Exactly. And I feel like being able to identify those like pain points in your training and then being able to find a solution for that within your notes or externally through asking questions or researching or watching instructionals, like it's only going to further help your development. And two, one thing I've seen a lot is like lower belts or people who are newer to jujitsu, 
have a hard time remembering what happened in their rounds and being able to recall exactly what happened or why they got their guard passed or why they got swept or why they keep getting arm barred. So being able to like go into the round knowing you're supposed to be remembering this is like a skill to gain in itself. And if you go into it knowing you need to write notes about what happens, you're going to be maybe a little bit more mentally present in your training. Yeah, yeah. If you can do the thinking beforehand, it makes it a lot easier to do the right thing when you're actually training. Otherwise, like you said, you kind of just go onto autopilot, you gravitate towards the things that are more fun for you, or maybe that you know you're going to succeed at more often. But that often doesn't align with what's best for you when it comes to your training. And if you can take those decisions out of your head and make them make those commitments to yourself before you actually start training. So rather than trying to show up at class and then just decide on the fly what to train, if you deliberated about this the night before and you decided, okay, here's what I'm going to focus on. It's a lot easier to steer your training in the right direction than if you just show up and roll. Yeah, for sure. So I want to know, I mean, is this process where you guys train, is this just you? Are you the the note-taking expert at your facility? Or is this something that everyone at your team does? So I had one other teammate at the gym I started in in Florida who also took a lot of notes. But like, other than that, it's really just been me. Like, I've kept it up since I started and I've, I've like moved states and moved gyms. And really, I haven't seen anybody else do it at this capacity where I'm just lugging around a binder like a freak. But (laughs) it works for me. And I always encourage everybody else to do it if they feel like their brain and their learning style like would be complementary to it. Yeah. I think that's a good caveat you added there that sometimes things that work for one person just might not work as well for another person. I know that most people in their journey will try note taking at some point. And most people will probably fall off of it and eventually just kind of go on autopilot. For the reasons we brought up here, I do think it is good for people to do some degree of note taking, at least to create that reflective process. So they're thinking about their training at the bare minimum. I think that's a good idea to do. But yeah, it's also worth pointing out that, look, not everyone responds to the same approach. For some people, they might just not get any value out of this process. And I think it's okay to tell people, look, hey, try something if it doesn't work for you. That's all right. There's so many other different ways to learn and to get better at jujitsu. This is just one tool in the toolbox. So don't feel bad if you're not the best note taker in the world. But I do think like you talked about, I think not enough people try it and stick with it. And I think there's more value there than people in jujitsu let on. For sure. And I think like, especially like with what you said, like the reflective and the like preemptive goal setting aspects of what I do with my notebook, like are something I think everybody could do even at some very minimal capacity and experience a lot of benefit. Whereas maybe like the notes on like moves and the pages and pages of move notes might not be what works best for everybody. But there's some aspect of notes and reflection and forethought that would benefit anybody's training schedule and anybody's training goals. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, Rachel, I, I got to ask, we covered quite a bit here. Was there anything else on the topic that you wanted to discuss, which we didn't get into yet? Oh, how fun. I love how I can hear you consulting your notes to get the answer on this right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm flipping through to see if there's anything else that was like super interesting. One thing I learned early on that I'm still a huge proponent of is I buy these erasable pens. <laughs> I was going to ask if you've got a preferred pen or a preferred binder that you use. I know that a lot of journal people are very particular about like the quality of the paper and what type of pen they're using. Yeah, I use these black ink erasable pens. Amazing (laughs) because you don't want to be writing in pencil as an adult. You just don't. But (laughs) I also make a lot of mistakes like in my notes and in general. (laughs) So it's nice to be able to erase those. (laughs) Yeah. That's a good point. I take my notes in permanent black ink and they're usually hideous because half of the shit on there is crossed out by the time I'm done with it because I didn't get it right the first time. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, hey, something else I wanted to ask you about, which is kind of related, you know, as I was looking into your background, 
I saw a bit about your instructional, which I thought was a really interesting topic. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, just so that if people want to learn more about your stuff, they can go and check it out? Yeah. So my first instructional is out on Jiu-Jitsu X. It's called Systematically Starting Sleeves. So it's kind of this overview of several different sleeve-based guards, which I thought was a cool idea for an instructional and something that like a lot of my gi game is built out of. And the whole idea of why I did that in that way was one of the key things for guard play, in my opinion, is being able to transition through several different guards and be able to be offensive from any of those positions while also knowing what key things you're defending, what your important movements are from those particular positions, like offense, defense, and movement from each position. And yeah, so this was just looking at all of that from several different sleeve-based guards. So like deep lasso, shallow lasso, collar sleeve, two-on-one grip, cross sleeve and pant, sit up guard with the sleeve fed, all of those things kind of stemming off of initial sleeve grips. Yeah, I really love that topic. I generally find that the more specific and actionable an instructional is, the more interested I'm going to be and the more I'm going to stick with it, right? There's a lot of instructionals that are just, you know, so-and-so's guide to the closed guard. But I, I think that if you pick a concept and you narrow in on it, like you did here, where you're talking specifically about grips and transitions in the gi, I think that stuff is awesome because it's going to teach people to think strategically about something that they probably aren't thinking enough about. I agree with you. It was a big revelation for me when I realized the importance of grip management, especially from the guard, and I realized that I wasn't thinking about it enough. So really cool topic for an instructional. I'll put a link to it in the show notes so that if anyone wants to check it out, it's easy to find. Beyond that, Rachel, anything else you wanted to chat about or promote while I've got you here? PJ Barch's new gym is opening up in a couple months down here in San Diego. If anybody wants to join, feel free to shoot me a message. <laughs> That's exciting. That's exciting. I guess the best way for people to contact you is Instagram, right? I'm presuming? Yes, for sure. Awesome. Cool. So I will put a link in the show notes to your IG. So if anyone wants to reach out and, and contact you, easy way to do that. Again, I'll put that there with the link to the instructional as well. I'll also, as I always do, include a, a link to our stuff. If you don't already know, everything we make is on bjjmentalmodels.com. If you're listening to this, I presume you already know about the podcast. But beyond that, we've also got what I think is one of the more popular jiu-jitsu newsletters in the space. Uh, we do a lot of analytical deep dive onto concepts, technique, mechanics, and strategy. It's free as well. So I generally recommend if you like the podcast, you will almost certainly also like the newsletter. You can get both of those two resources at BJJ Mental Models. Models.com. Beyond that, that's also where you can sign up for our awesome premium service. People often ask what BJJ Mental Models Premium is. Basically, there's three parts. There's content, there's coaching, and there's community. On the content side, we've got over 50 hours of masterclass-style conversation courses with experts like Rafael Lovato Jr., Claudia Doval, Andrew Wiltsey, Marco Ciccarelli. Big long list. Like I said, over 50 hours of stuff on there, and we're expanding upon it all the time. We've also got our awesome coaching service, which Rachel is a part of. So if you've got rolling footage, send it over our way. We'll give you a really deep narrated technical breakdowns. Uh, you're probably going to get a lot more value out of this than you would if you just studied more instructionals. There's really nothing like having a high-level grappler micro-analyze your game. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the best way in the world to get that service. So again, it's all bundled in. Do recommend you check it out. And of course, our community. We've got an amazing Discord community. It's actually one of the main reasons why people sign up is to get access to that group. Highly recommend joining and giving it a shot. Again, free trial, so you can try it at no risk. You can just get all of that stuff at bjjmentalmodels.com, but I'll also put a link to that in the show notes as well to make it easy. But Rachel, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate everything here. Great insight into a topic that we really haven't talked much about before. I think it's underserved in the community. And also a big thanks to you for your help on the reviews, man. I've got some amazing feedback on, on your feedback, and that's always what I want to hear. So big thanks to, for helping out all of our community members with those too. Yeah, thank you. That makes me super happy to hear. <laughs> <laughs> 
Awesome. And thanks to the listeners as well. I do greatly appreciate the time and attention. I know it's a, a longer podcast than some, and I know that we release a lot more episodes than some. And man, when I see the statistics and I see how much time some of you people out there have spent listening to us, it still does blow my mind. Just want you to know that even if you're a free listener and you're not paying, I still greatly do appreciate the fact that you're giving me the time of day. So thanks a lot to you listeners as well. Really do appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. Take care. Thank you.